just so happy that, uh, that you're able to join us. My name is Rabbi Irv Elson, and I am the uh, director of JWB Jewish Chaplains Council. Uh, for those of you you who don't know about JWB. I used to say we're the military branch of JCCA, but Daron refused to buy me any tanks or airplanes. So uh, what we do is we provide a meaningful Jewish life for Jews in the military. So uh, let me let me start. Uh, if this is uh, not your first session, you've probably heard this before, but um, this session is being recorded. And uh, we understand that some of you don't wish not to be recorded. So you may turn up your camera, but we, we encourage you if you're comfortable to stay visible and so we could all feel uh, together. Um, this uh, session is on strategic planning. If this is not your intended session, you should stay here anyhow, because it's going to be just a pretty spectacular session. But uh, you can always go back to uh, spot me and try a different session. And joining me today is my my uh, my friend and uh, JCC Association associate, uh, Andy, uh, Andy Powler. Uh, Andy, you can wait for everybody. And uh, our names appear as the host at the top of your participants list, so you can chat with us uh, dur during or uh, or after the conference. A um, couple other things: uh, we invite you to rename yourself in Zoom with your name and agency if you feel comfortable. We've enabled closed caption, and you have the option to turn it off and on in the uh, in the bottom toolbar. And if there's anything that Andy or I could do to enhance your experience, please don't, don't hesitate to let us know. Uh, and of course, uh, we have to have a, a commercial break here. We're really thrilled to offer this conference uh, at no cost and, uh, and through our very generous sponsors. And uh, so please go ahead and um, help us uh, by visiting the booths of our virtual vendor halls um, uh, today, a little later on today. And we also encourage you to connect with them during ProCon. Um, so uh, just so excited to facilitate today's session on strategic planning. Uh, so uh, what you might not know is that I was a naval officer for over uh, 35 years and I was taught something very, very important. I learned that number one, captains, Navy captains think about tactics, one star admirals think about logistics, but two star admirals and above, they think uh, strategy. And uh, certainly our guest speaker today is, is a fourth star expert on, uh, on strategic planning. How's that, Amy? Putting a lot of pressure on you. Um, so uh, before I introduce it, just a couple less um, uh, housekeeping things. Uh, there's going to be a short Q&A after the session if we have time. Write your questions on the chat and we'll feed them to our speaker. Don't forget to virtually raise your hand. And, and then finally, um, you know, Jewish tradition teaches us that we're created in, in the image of God. So, um, you know, as, as, as you discuss in dialogue and debate, uh, please remember to be uh, respectful and inclusive. And now to our to our guest speaker. Just so excited to uh, to introduce her. Uh, Amy Lavin is the has been the CEO of the Strom Jewish Center of Greater Seattle since 2017. But what really stands out, uh, despite all the different awards and degrees and everything that you can read about, is that she's a fellow cyclist. So she she's got to be a, a a great person. Uh, you can read her bio in the Spot Me uh, app. And without uh, any further ado, Amy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Rabbi. And thank you very, very much for your service. We are very, very lucky. Can everybody hear me? Okay, wonderful. So thank you. And uh, now I'm up, I hope I'm up to the task that he has set for, in front of me. Um, and please share questions. My whole goal here is to introduce a set of sometimes complex ideas um, and meaty topics. And sometimes that prompts a lot of questions. Please don't be shy. And uh, if you, you know, either today or in the future, follow up with me or anyone else who can help uh, answer some of your questions. Um, so I wanted to, uh, I'm going to open up, I'm going to start sharing my screen. And um, then, uh, and of course, we're going to hope technology supports us as we envision it. Um, so are you all seeing thumbs up if we're seeing this, the title slide? Okay, so um, I admit, I really like to have, um, sessions where I can, um, and is everybody just seeing the full PowerPoint or are you seeing yourselves in gallery? Everybody okay? Just seeing PowerPoint. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, I'm gonna, I can see some of your faces, but I can't see them all. So please um, wave and the other hosts will prompt me to stop and uh, answer your questions. Or as Irv said, we can get to them at the end. Um, so again, this is an introduction into a fairly meaty topic. And prior to my uh, roles at the J, um, I'm one of those people who came over from corporate America. And uh, I, did, I did a lot of um, strategic planning in other capacities. And so when this was brought 
some major strategic planning um, concepts and processes were brought to a lot of us back, oh gosh, scary to say, about 11 and a half months ago, right? So about this time last year, when we were all thrown into this crazy mode, um, we were lucky enough to have a consultant present um, a concept to us. So I'm going to try to walk us through strategic planning at a high level, and then really try to focus it in how it's been leveraged and activated here at RJ and in some other JCCs and other Jewish organizations around the country, but really hope people think about it as, as a, an approach to thinking about where your program, your team, your organization can go. So um, with that, let's get going. Um, so I love this quote, which is the future will reward clarity and punish certainty. So um, the idea that any of us know what's happening tomorrow or like in the next hour, and we've been taught that unfortunately painfully in the past year, right? While we all knew we had no control before, we were just made vividly aware of that with all the changes. And here in Washington state, you know, we might have to roll back in our phases next Monday, which may actually change us. And who knows even if the rules of this rollback are going to look like the next rollback. So for me to think I have any control of anything is, is naive. And so the idea of a framework like this helps you have ideas about where you're going so that you can move swiftly and, and agilely, but it does not bank on the fact that you can predict the future, which is a good thing because none of us can. So the difference between clarity and certainty is clarity as noted here is really the, the quality of being coherent and intelligible and transparent and pure or just clear. You understand it. The idea of certainty is that you have firm conviction that something is the case. So none of us have that. So we're seeking clarity and not pretending for certainty. And so with that, you have to embrace ambiguity and know that none of us have control, but our ability to plan for various things is what will keep us um, successful. And it's really about being able to act in anticipation and respond quickly. And you're seeing these um, logos from um, Matt Rainin, who was the consultant. And so he had presented this to the JCCA um, and many of us execs last year. And so you'll see me kind of intermixing some of his slides with my own. And so I just wanted to give you context that that's where that's coming from. But this idea that with strategic planning, your team becomes better able to respond, adapt, and move quickly in these uncertain times. Um, and that's really what this is about. Because if what we do is start processing every change as we receive it, there's just no way that you can keep up. You can't move fast enough. You can't adapt your resourcing. Your teams can't keep up. So our idea is to be ready for a variety of scenarios so that we can move quickly. Um, I'm a fan of strategic planning for a few reasons that I'll share with all of you, which is um, it provides this open space for ideating, right? So really the ability to kind of get out of the daily stuff. It's so hard when we all know all the things that bog us down every day in our environments, right? And so whether it's a machine broken on the fitness center floor or, you know, staffing issues going on or the fact that like the money doesn't roll that way in your organization, if you just talk about what you always do, you're just going to keep thinking about it in the ways you've always thought about it. And so the ability to suspend that and say, wait, pretend I don't work at a J, just step back and think, what's going on? And how do I really pull myself out of this, this funnel lens that I live in most of the time, because that's how we get real stuff done? Um, how do we get out of that and look at a more global landscape of the world around us? And, and we'll walk through some of this and how we uh, can make sense of it in our world. But this idea of a, a new taxonomy is also really important. When you walk through a strategic planning exercise and specifically a framework like the one we're going to look at, it kind of equips your team to talk differently. So there are terms that we're going to see in the future here in this presentation. Um, and my team uses this language now. And the ability to have terms, definitions, and a shared taxonomy about what's happening in our org and the world around us really allows us to speak more efficiently and with common understanding. And it also is, is a new taxonomy. So we're not talking about just lifeguard staffing, the fitness machines, whether or not our ECS team is you know humming along and, and everything else. We're able to step back and talk about kind of the macro environment around us in language that, that is meaningful and consistent among us. Um, this idea that strategic planning, I mentioned this earlier, designs for flexibility so that your ability to make changes on the go but they're not just like willy nilly, pick it as you go. It's, hey, I know where I'm going and it might be, there might be a variety of paths to get there, but I'm already equipped with a set of tools and first steps and second steps that I can take should any one of those scenarios materialize. It also forces your own agency to clarify or your own team. And I, I wanna be really clear, like 
over the last year, we've done a lot of this at the agency level. This can be done on your own team, in your own program, but really thinking about how do you get clarity about where you're taking your program you know, department or agency. If you know where you're going, the steps you take along the way are a lot clearer because you have some sense of your compass and where True North is, as opposed to like chasing, you know, the shiny object or, you know, squirrel, squirrel everywhere around, around the area. Um, and it aids decision-making at all levels. So the more clear you are on your direction and the more you've had these um, sophisticated and kind of comprehensive conversations with your team, the more you can make decisions um, as you go. So um, that's kind of the intro about strategic planning. Um, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with saying, you know, as we dive into this, this is really about thinking about anything you're doing from the outside in. And I know here and um, often when we think about a new budget or we think about the next program we're gonna launch, we think about the things we already know we know we think about the team that we've got in place and we think about what resources we have and we think about, gosh, how do I do better at what I'm doing? And you kind of got to, at this strategic planning level that we're going to talk about, it's kind of set that aside for a moment, step back and just sit for a second and then say, what if I was just a fly on the wall? What is going on in the world around me? And how do I think about the things I'm seeing and, oh my gosh, you know, we haven't dealt with a pandemic like this in a hundred years. And wow, people are, you know, everyone is stuck at home and oh my gosh, everyone's afraid of every decision they make because these have health implications and people have loved ones they're worried about and all these different things. Those are really big things. And wait, Wi-Fi is good, but guess what? All of a sudden when everyone's on it at the same time of day, that's not working so well. These are huge macro issues, right? The travel shut down, no one's driving anywhere, all these big, big ideas. And you know what? That's different than saying like, do I open for another hour? Do I hire another staff member? Very different altitude of thinking, right? So zoom way, way out. What is going on in the world around me? And then we'll get to this idea of like, what's in the world that's like more relevant to me? And then what does it mean to me? So really backing up with this huge open aperture, starting there and leaving the fact that you know your title or where you work and what your you know daily job is, set that aside for a second. So with that, and you know, the question I kept asking out loud and, and there's a, you know, song like this, but what does the world need now? And what the world needs now might be very different. And what we just lived through was very different what the world needed, you know, two weeks before, right? February 15th to April 15th, those two months, very different sets of needs. So letting go of what you think has always been the way it is and the way you've always done it, but what does the world need right now? What is going on and, and how do I suspend all this other detail to sit in that question? So this is this idea of stepping back and thinking big. And we're gonna do a breakout session now. And just for you know about seven minutes, we're gonna step back and think to ourselves like, what are those major themes? And sometimes, and, and an exercise that um, this consultant took us through and has remained something I do all the time is think about headlines that you see out there in the world or conversations you're having with friends on Zoom, on the phone, now hopefully outside at a distance, safely, masked, whatever. But like, what are these big macro things, these big thematic trends that are catching your eye or what has happened and how has that shifted? What was the conversation we were all having a year ago at the beginning of May? What was the conversation we were having in the end of August? What were we talking about in November? January, you know, all these things, but step back and as a group in your, in your breakouts, think about some of those major trends and themes and just collect them. Um, we'll hopefully have a little bit of time now or feed into the ongoing conversation. Um, just talk about that, capture some of those themes so we might be ready to share them. But um, if you could go into your breakouts and we're gonna hopefully do this just with the group we've got on and um, talk about those themes and capture them. Okay. All righty, so we're gonna move on. Um, and hopefully people were able to um, kind of pull back. And I don't know if we, uh, if you wanna unmute yourself, just throw out a few, you know, high level thematic ideas that maybe you and your team covered while you guys were out in your breakouts. Anyone have anything they wanna share? Yeah, so our our group um, talked about mental health and how it's been destigmatized and diversity and inclusion 
um, is a real conversation and finding people. Recruitment has evolved. Vaccinations, uh, technology, and being able to adapt quickly, and the actual news and uh, sometimes fake news. But now we're looking at news of CDC changes and needing to know what's changed. Fantastic. Anybody have any other additions? Yeah, I have some. Um, we had uh, talked about the change in the fitness market with people buying home, gym equipment, things like that. Um, just virtual programming, how um, some things we don't want to go back to normal, uh, how to open safely and washing hands. And then we also had the, um, the ability to find people to work, recruiting workers. Fantastic. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna jump forward and say, this is like exactly what this is all about, right? Just a smattering of this stuff that we just throw up on a wall and say, oh my gosh, all this stuff is happening around us. Again, where's the world at? And this helps us figure out what does the world need now? So there's changes in, in commuting behavior. What the, what's that gonna to do our, to our early childhood school, right? Or like the way people are you know, gonna have blended work at home schedules and the fact, I mean, the fitness thing is huge, right? And how that might impact many of our Js outdoors, right? These exodus from major cities and how long will that last? All these things, everything you just talked about, not to mention, um, not captured here, but something else is also climate change, right? Things like that that are happening, happening all around us. So that's exact, that was fantastic to hear. It sounds like people um, captured that, uh, that and uh, really ran with it. So that's fantastic. So now you sit there and say, okay, what does this mean to our world, right? And the truth is, when you're, when you're going to stop and say, okay, gosh, what do I do with all this? You could be overwhelmed with how you go about this, right? There are so many different ways to tackle this. And all I'm going to say is find a path, choose a process, a framework, a, a methodology, and stick with it because it's really overwhelming. And you can spend as much time spinning and choosing the process as you do um, actually executing it. And so I, I was telling um, Rabbi Irv on the, in the breakout just before this um, that what was so fantastic for me is that when Matt Rain and this consultant brought this framework to us last spring, summer, late in the spring, I was just like, oh my gosh, this, this makes enough sense. It's not perfect. Nothing is perfect, but it gives me an anchor to hold on to and a framework and methodology to use, and I can take it forward and we will keep iterating and learning and working with it. It's just really important to, to take something and go with it. So now um, we're going to move into something that he introduced and, and taught us about scenario planning. And scenario planning is really about thinking about, again, what's going on around us? How does it impact the, the world that we operate in? What are we uniquely able to do? So where is that intersection of the outside world, the visions and values that drive all of us specifically? What are we about? What are our JCCs about? Who, who are we in our community? And what are we equipped to do, right? Because you might chase something and say, gosh, you know, there's something going on in, in travel. Well, it's not like all of a sudden we're going to become a hospitality industry, right? Like in, you know, setting up hotels. I mean, I guess we could become, you know, Jewish hostels, but the reality is that's not really core. So we're not going to spend a lot of time there, but ultimately what we're trying to get at with the strategy is the intersection of the world around us, who we are in the world and what we're about and what we're equipped to do. So we got started with a framework, right? And, and, and choosing a set of characteristics that will define scenarios. So again, we're choosing something called scenario planning. And this is an art and a science. I don't know that anyone would say that they are a master at this because there are so many components, influences, and, and other factors that go into it. And as you think about stepping out into a strategic planning process, really important to think about who do you need to involve in the process, right? So there's the people who are actually gonna help you do it. There's the buy-in from the people you need. If you need funding, you need to think about where the money's gonna come from. And, and understanding who has to be on that train with you is really important. Um, and what's the best approach? This stuff is we're gonna walk through, I mean, I've got what, 25 more minutes to walk you through some real, 30 more minutes to walk you through some really heavy stuff. So is it best for your group that you're choosing to include to do it kind of all at once? Do you take a full day offsite, a two day retreat? Or do you say, you know what? We are going to spend you know, two hours on this today. We're gonna to come back three more times and in between, in between, we'll all kind of marinate in it. And that might vary depending on who you are and who your uh, participants are, how they operate. You know, Some people can think really quickly on their feet. Some people really need some time to see like, sit with it, think about it, understand its relevance and come back. So really think about that. And um, 
staging and, and the process may be important. And then buckling in for this ambiguity. It's going to suck for a while. It's going to be really hard. It's going to be meaty and, and messy. And ultimately, you might get to some clarity, but you're never really done. So there are going to be moments where you're going to have like a snapshot of clarity and you're going to say, I get it. And then something else will change. The CDC rules will change. So you'll be able to change capacity. You'll be able to, you know, like somebody, you know, wow, what if you found it fell into a bunch of funding that might shift or, you know, something else changes in the world around you. Your school district changes the way they operate. All these different things might cause you to go like, oh my gosh, just when I thought I had it, something else changes, right? So you're never really done, but the more you get practiced at it, the more quickly you can move. Um, so now we're going to kind of look in an example and I'm going to move right into, into this example. So when this concept of uh, strategic and scenario planning was brought to the execs at the JCC, through the JCCA to all the JCC execs, um, we kind of stepped back and we said, you know, it was determined there are kind of two major factors affecting nearly everything going on in our world and our world being a JCC world, right? So people spending time together and economic and financial stability. So when you think about that, those are the, we're about bringing people together and making sure that we can fund it and provide the services on an ongoing basis to be a reliable partner in our community, all of that, right? So it was really important um, that we thought about the world in these, in these axes. Do you know how hard it is to get to these axes? It's really hard because the truth is you could say, oh, it's about, you know, somebody might step back and if you're in the, in the ECS or ECE programs, these may be good axes, but there may be different axes, right? School district opening, schedules in the community, um, cost of competitive programs, you know, uh, there could be so many different things that could sit on these axes, but for the JCC agencies as a whole, these were determined to be two vital axes. And I'm gonna say for my use and purposes and application of this, I found them very strong, but that doesn't mean they work for everybody. And, and all I can say is getting to these axes is an art and a science in itself. So if you think about this, when we were thinking about, gosh, what do JCCs do in a world where no one can spend time together? You know, you think about, gosh, when are people going to be able to spend time together? And what will that look like when they do come back together? And it's not only about the JCC financial stability, it's really about community. What, you know, a year ago, none of us knew what was truly going to happen with the economy you know, nationally, regionally, globally, none of us knew. So when you're really worried that families may go through and as we've seen with many, many, many people, job loss, shift in jobs, new roles at home, you know, people leaving the workforce, all this other stuff, that causes a financial stability issue at, at the very individual personal household level. And then at the global level, we've dealt with a whole lot of disruption and, and um, Kind of episodic change over the last year. So again, these are the axes that um, that worked for us. And from these axes was determined this framework. And as you'll see, there were four quadrants here. And they were, I'm going to start in the bottom left. It was called plagues, tribes, exile, and mana. And I'm just going to say, we're going to think of this again. I'm not asking anyone here to use this, but let's think about this as a concept. And the idea was defining these quadrants in a way that you very quickly can name them and understand what they stand for. So someone living in a world with plagues, which many of us felt like we were in, you know, April, May, June, things started to, you know, as we got trained in how to live in a pandemic world, it shifted a little bit. But the word plagues, you quickly know what it means. And, you know, for every one of these quadrants, there were pages written on the depth, you know, detailed depth of what that looks like. But most importantly, you knew what plagues were, tribes, you quickly know that tribes mean people are separated. People have different sets of values determining their behavior and how they operate. Exile, some people are cast away very distantly. Some people stay close. And mana, in theory, everything's all great. But what we know in mana in the world of COVID is it's not that everything's great for everyone. It's that things are great in some ways and in different ways than the world was before. But most importantly, every one of these quadrants became in itself a a bounded scenario. And in that scenario, every one of these scenarios was described by a set of kind of characteristics that defined how the world operated. So again, and but they were all grounded in these axes of financial stability and gathering and people convening. So we care about, you know, on the left side, 
What if nobody ever comes together again? What if people are exiled into different geographic locations? What if plagues, we're so scared of spending time together, we don't. On the flip side, we get to spend more time together, but we don't have money to do the things that we, we what we used to do. Or the flip side of it is, you know, a few people have a lot of money, which is what we're seeing in some of these very, um, you know, polarized communities where, you know, wealth has expanded significantly for some and then really been trying for others. So I know this is kind of, this is confusing and meeting, meaty, but the whole important thing is that you define these set of axes that are determining factors for the program, department, agency that you're trying to work with. And then in that, you're defining a set of scenarios that are distinct in many ways so that you can actually know when you are living in the plague world. You know when you are living in the exile world because the words you've used to describe them actually are distinct. So um, I'm gonna maybe just pause because this is pretty meaty and I'm gonna ask um, if there are any before we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna run into another breakout to talk about this, but if there are one or two questions, um, I might ask people to unmute themselves and ask because what we're gonna break out and talk about, and I'll say this, is thinking about axes that might be relevant today. And, and I know that when you're in your breakout sessions, you're kind of in a mix of program areas, um, roles in the organization, but again, try to maybe create some um, cohesion around just the way the conversation unfolds because we're not gonna be able to solve anyone's per problems right here, but we're gonna be able to talk about how you take this concept and put it to work. So does anyone have any questions? And you can put it in the chat or um, just raise your hand. No, okay. Well, with that, um, we are gonna send people out into breakouts now for about 10 minutes and um, just uh, practice talking about these types of concepts, these types of axes, right? And, and if you want, come up with a pair um, that your team you know, may want to, that at least your team can together understand what you mean when you're talking to each other and say, um, you know, just pick a part of your J or any J that's in your group um, and, and try to practice this for a second. Try to practice the language of the, of the axes and the scenarios. So with that, we'll send you off, send notes and, and questions back to us if you have them. All righty, um, do we have most of our people back? Can't see the count now. Okay, great. Um, so um, does anyone want to share anything uh, that came out of that? Did people, were people able to actually like practice a little bit? Heads nodding. Yes, no. I, I don't mind sharing. We actually had several that we were able to put on, so on this access. Um, so one was, will uh, guidelines, and that was a loose term, not one agency, guidelines mm -hmm. move more towards normal or will they revert? And then separately, the other axis is, will the community's acceptance and um, adhe like adherence to these increase and comply or go backwards and kind of rebel? And then where do we align with our decisions within these scenarios was one, but we actually had three. So another one was news, like if news will continue to become more and more diverse in its fiction and nonfiction, or will it kind of get figured out to have more accurate news stories, but separately, will the public have more of a, a rejection of, you know, make their own decisions, or will they really start believing everything? And so how do we meet our communication within those quadrants? So. Fantastic. Those are like really big topics. So that's great. Okay. Anyone else want to share? Thank you so much for doing so. Anybody else? Okay, well, we're gonna move on because we have some other stuff to, um, to do with this. So now, but thank you, that sounds like exactly the type of conversation. Um, so how do we practice connecting these scenarios to your J and program area? And literally, as you had those axes that, you know, if it was about uh, adherence and policy change or even, um, you know, gosh, what if it's about adherence and like, a common understanding of truth if all the news is despair, right? But what are those two axes that you would potentially put together? And then you have your four scenarios. And then you kind of have, you kind of have to walk through each of those scenarios and kind of, this was all designed around a plague scenario. But if you can imagine, and the reason I'm sharing this slide, which looks like kind of messy for this type of presentation is I want people to know there are like worksheets for things like this, right? There is a toolkit that can be used and put to work 
that helps you understand how do I take this concept of a, of a quadrant that I think I roughly can understand and how do I think about what it means? And these worksheets were really, really helpful for our team to walk through because what it helps you do is take this big broad concept and distill it. So now if you look at this worksheet, um, and again, this set of worksheets exists for every one quadrant. What does this idea of a world where no one really knows what's truth and yet they're really adhering to it? I mean, that's weird, right? Because why would you adhere to something you don't believe? But there's going to be, I mean, whatever. There's all types of people. If you're in that world where people are adhering to something that's not true, what does the world look like? Okay. And, and how does that impact the lives of people? And what are people looking for in Jewish community life in that mode, right? It might be that all of a sudden Jewish text and law, which is something that is obviously sustained over time and persisted, might be the only grounding foundation people have. So it might actually become more important. But how do you walk through these questions? And then what do you think about the challenges and the opportunities in that environment? So how do you become the voice of truth in a situation like that or a trusted advisor or you know, a safe place for people to be when the world is so chaotic, right? What are the opportunities and what are the challenges? If people don't believe anything and everyone just becomes like anarchy, then you're going to have a problem having anyone actually, you know, affiliate with your organization and pay your dues and, you know, consistently belong because everyone's running wild. But the point is, you take a set of worksheets and you start to think about what does the world look like in that environment and you actually fill this in. So when our team was done with this, this workbook, this worksheet, it was like three pages long of just messy, messy notes, like a digital whiteboard, right? And I say that because this process isn't clean, but you have to go through the, the thinking. And what I also found is that the first time you go through it, you're like, huh, this took about 15, 20 minutes. Then you do the next one. You're like, that one took an hour. Guess what? We didn't really get what we were doing. And you have to go back and revisit it because you, every time you do this, you start to really understand the level of depth you need to get into and how far you have to challenge yourself in order to really unlock the kernels of those ideas and opportunities. But basically you're gonna go through all these questions and these worksheets. You're gonna ask yourself, what does your agency need to stop doing? What do you start doing? What do you continue or amplify, right? And so, you know, the start, stop, continue is, is a framework many of us use in many things, and that should be used here. If I'm living in a world of anarchy, what do we keep doing? What do we stop doing? And what do we uh, start doing, right? So again, super messy worksheet um, because it's gonna get very um, messy. Um, um, I'm seeing this questions about the uh, people who are kind of straddling multiple, um, phases right now or multiple uh, scenarios. Um, where does one get these worksheets? We can point everybody to this later. Um, I know this will be published um, and maybe I'll be able to add a final end cap slide that actually has a link. It actually sits on um, JFNA's page. So JFNA and th they helped fund the uh, Matt Rainin consultant and this entire worksheet workbook, which is about 45, 50 slides, sits there, it's totally open to the public. So I can make sure that that link gets added to this um, session later. Um, Amy, if I, I can just interrupt for 30 seconds. Um, so within the next two weeks, right here on Spot mm -hmm. Me, mm -hmm. you're gonna have a recording of this session plus all the slides. Perfect, thank you. And I'll, I'll make sure to update that last slide so people know where to find that. But if anyone wants to go there uh, later, it's a jfna.org and uh, or jewishtogether.org and it's, um, under resources or something, uh, but it is it is available for download and use. Um, and there's so, one more. I'm sorry. There's one yeah. more question here. Uh, we are currently in the quote unquote tribe section, trying to yeah. move to the monophase. Do you recommend uh, doing these worksheets for both or just where you currently are? I say all of them because you have to fully understand how they're distinct. And sometimes if you don't, you're actually going to potentially blend. Um, there's dimensions of exile and tribes that feel really the same until you're really in it and then you understand how how they are different and the other thing you're realizing is the fact that you can name that you know that you're in those phases is really interesting and great the other thing you're going to realize is half of your community is sitting in plagues and half of your community is sitting in in uh exile right and they're all kind of happening at the same time but but that might also map to your segmentation right so l like if we think about older populations being vaccinated for the most part, anyone who wants a vaccine, right? Those people are living a different life right now than those of us with children who are not eligible vac for vaccines because of their age. So it's a really different, there's a, you know, a dichotomy there among very many other things. Okay, 
So as we get to this list of start, stop, amplify, and we get this list of challenges and opportunities, you're gonna have a dizzying array of things of, oh my gosh, there's so much we can do. How do we know what to do? And then we do something called choosing some core bets and some side bets. And um, we're gonna get there um, by, by walking through a couple of things. First of all, you have to think about the time frame that you're thinking about, right? So it's not like everything's gonna, well, certain things changed overnight when we shut down last March, but when you're planning on this horizon, you kind of have to say, I'm making a bet of 18 to 30 months out. That is the time frame that I am trying to map my scenario planning to. Pick that time frame, start mapping what scenario you think you're gonna be in there, or those of you who are kind of straddling, you know, two or three of them. Like we're still gonna be, you know, 40% of our population, these segments are gonna be here, these other segments are here, or if you're using a different set of, you know, anarchy uh, type axes, thinking about which parts of your organization or which parts of your community are going to be at which points over time. And then um, thinking about how that, uh, how that shifts over time. Then again, you get back to who are we? What are we about? If the world is sitting in that mode in 24 months from now, if I pick a 24 month horizon, what are we how do we know where we go as a J or as a fitness program when we know so many people now work out at home? Like you can apply this at so many different levels. What are we equipped to do if the world looks like that? And how do we get ourselves to be relevant and well-resourced and ready to go at that point? And so we pick a set of core bets and side bets. And again, all of this, you don't need to take notes because we can get all this um, and it all exists online. But core bets are those things that are the big 70, 80, 90% of your organization. I know that we are going to be in an exile phase in 24 months. And therefore I know that I'm going to um, focus the great majority of my resources, programming time, you know, community engagement on this type of stuff. And that's gonna take most of your agency's efforts to corral around that. There's a bunch of side bets though, because what if the world shifts and what if these variants are suddenly taking us all over and we revert or the type of fear in the community changes or the Suez Canal was blocked for longer, which impacts a whole bunch of other, I mean, all these other things, right? That we have to think about all the time. And those side bets allow you to have a couple investments on the side that are relevant to what you're doing, but offer you just like a toe in the water if things shift. And what's important there is like, if you think about it, um, we all already have side bets in our business, right? Rentals at our facility is a side bet, right? It's a way to bring money into the J. It's not a core focus of ours, but it allows us to monetize part of our organization in a side bet way, right? And if suddenly we could do nothing as a JCC, but I could rent out my building and plenty of us had that conversation last summer. What if somebody else could make better use of my building for the next year? at least it would keep my JCC, you know, bringing some level of income in. That might be a side bet. A rental facility might be your side bet when your core bet is obviously to drive family engagement in a Jewish context, right? So that's a different level of investment, but you always want to have a few things in play should things shift. And then um, you have to figure out how do you put this to work? How do you shift your resources towards your core bet and your side bets? And you don't wanna have a zillion of these. You kinda of wanna have one core bet and you might be playing three side bets, right? So that you can kind of dabble in those as the world evolves. You also can engage partners in many of these things to think about how you might partner with a, another agency in your community on a side bet. But now it's time to take all that, shift the way you plan your budget, shift the way your team is configured to move in the direction of your core bet and you got to think about that starting now so you're ready when you get there. So I'm going to stop now and say, you just put it to work. You watch and you learn and you adapt. None of us, like, again, this is an art and a science. And it's about thinking, you know, measuring twice, cut once. If you have a few things you've thought about before you go do them, it's more likely that one of them will prove out to be successful. And when things shift, you can actually take advantage because you're, you're, you're kind of on your toes. You're ready to go. You're not being caught on your heels every time. And you can act in anticipation and respond quickly. So um, I know we're running up against time. Irv has a couple of closing comments. So I am available later if people want to reach out to me. Um, and as noted, this will be posted for everybody to refer to later. 
Great, Amy, thank you so, so much for, for a, a wonderful presentation. Uh, you and I were talking a little earlier, as we say in the military, to embrace the suck. But uh, you've, you've taught us not only how to embrace it, but how to thrive in it and really come out of the other end. So thank you so, so much to all our, um, all our guests uh, who have been here. Uh, thank you so, so much. Just want to remind you, don't forget to drop by the vendor hall, which is going to open up in a little bit today. And uh, a special warm invitation to all of you to join us for our closing movement moment uh, later on uh, today. If you want to continue the conversation with Amy, you can do so via Spot Me. And again, uh, a big thanks to, uh, to Andy for uh, co-hosting this with me. And uh, we'll see you all um, either in the vendor hall or at the movement moment. Uh, so thank you very, very much. Have a great day.